Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Podcast, episode number 65. The legend Larry Wysoon and trailing the hunter's moon. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. I'm Trent Cole. And I'm Richie Elam from Blitz TV. And you're listening to Big Buck Registry, Big Buck Podcast. Hey folks, this is Dean Vanier with Northwoods Common Sense. And you're listening to my favorite and most informative hunting podcast show on the internet, Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Podcast. Hey, this is Doug Castrava from the Horny Buck Seed Company, and you're listening to my favorite podcast on iTunes, the Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Podcast. Hey, what's going on? This is Jay Scott, your host of the Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Podcast. Thanks for tuning in again uh, to the show. I'm sure you're listening on in your car or you've got some earbuds in and you're probably going to listen to this guy over here too. Dusty, what's happening? Man, I'm almost speechless. Speechless. What? Almost. What almost. Since when? I mean, that's like a miracle. I'm almost speechless, man. Why? Because of our guest. I've been thinking about this for a very, very long time. But, you know, I'm amped up. Hunting season is close. Every time we get on here, we're another few days closer to whitetail bow hunting season. Come on. Yeah, I mean, the bow season is pretty much in full bloom across the country, I think, as far as I can tell. Maybe a couple spots that haven't opened up, but, hey, man, it's showtime. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, it's, it's the air is right, you know. They're talking 65-degree mm-hmm. mornings coming up here soon here in Ohio, and uh, wow, I am really, really, really getting excited. How about 49 degrees? How does that make you feel? Wow, that that's hunting weather for sure. That's like in the stand weather. We had that this past week. Really? Yep. Wow. It was in the morning. Of course, it warmed up to like 75. But still, when you feel 49 degree weather at night and you're covering up, you're like, it's time, baby. Let's go. <laughs> it's time for sure. Absolutely. Yep. You know, if you ain't amped up for hunting season, something wrong with mm-hmm. you. Dusty, would you like to explain to our People that are joining us right now, who we've got on the show tonight. We have a legend. A legend. A legend. Truly, truly a legend. Truly a legend. You know, somebody that's really, really done some amazing things for the whitetail habitat management, food supplement for the whitetail, and, and all kinds of other critters that run the woods. Man, it's just, you know, the excitement of of having this special guest on with us. You know, we're going to learn something. We're going to talk about some things that he's mastered. You know, that this guy can take a set of antlers and bring a buck right in his lap. And that, that in my eyes, is very impressive. Yeah, he's been doing it for over 30 years. And and I I grew up by watching this fine gentleman on TV teaching me how to hunt whitetails. And he is a gentleman. I mean, he's a gentleman of the finest caliber. Uh, yes, sir. Just to, yes, sir. He's right. Yeah, he's a great guy. Larry Wysoon, he is joining us right here on the Big Buck Podcast. You know, Larry is a uh, very polite, yes, very informative. Yes. And he knows what he's talking about when it comes to hunting. So knowledgeable. And, yes, uh, sir. Man, I just listen to him talk all day. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I'm tired of hearing you talk. So let's get on with the show with Larry. I'm with you. Larry Wysoon, welcome to the Big Buck Registries Big Buck Podcast. How are you, sir? Jay, I'm absolutely great. It was such a pleasure to, you know, we kind of knew each other a little bit through Facebook and some other places and through reputations. And finally get to meet you at the Kittery Train Post this past weekend. It really was, was, was a great thrill as far as I'm concerned. I had a chance to listen to the bog band. Uh, the, I can't even talk this evening. It seemed like you got me excited, by God. Nice. <laughs> right. Right. We like to hear that. <laughs> I like that. But I had a chance to listen just a little bit, and so I know what you guys are about, and it's an absolute pleasure and honor uh, to be here with you, back alley. That's awesome. We're, we're awesome. always glad to have a uh, – you're a legend to us, Larry, so we're glad to have you on the show and get talks. Oh, my goodness. I know. Talk some hunting, and uh, I had a great time meeting you at the Kittery Trading Post, too. Uh, I know that um, the pig man was there, Brian Quaka, and he was doing some shows, too, and then uh, – 
I think there was a country and western western singer upstairs that kind of booted us. We all had to go outside because he was taking up all the floor space. <laughs> it, it is what it is, right? It is. It is. Tom Miranda was there too. Of course, Tom was probably, as far as I'm concerned, one of the most famous of the of the bow hunters there is in this world. And I feel very fortunate to call him an old friend. Tom and I've been friends probably 30 plus years. I've dealt with him numerous times on different TV shows, going back to Whitetail Country and and uh, some of the others that we did. And then the years when I was with Thompson Center Arms, he right. produced our uh, game trails and some of our other shows. And I've had a chance to hunt with Tom as well several times. So it's really great to see him up there. And it's been a while, I think, since he's been up in the Northeast. But just to spend time with him as well was was kind of like old home week. And of course, that's kind of the way I feel about going up in that part of the country. Is I've, I've been coming up here now for a bunch of years and, and uh, get to see friends that, you know, you just kind of see every once in a while and kind of find out what they've been doing as far as bear hunting is in that part of the world and as far as deer hunting and moose hunting. So it's an absolute pleasure being up here with you guys. That's cool. We like it when you guys come around. We're, Dusty and I are hoping to get out and venture out to see, you know, your parts of the world too because it's just so interesting to get out in the U.S. and see different parts and see how people live and thrive and all that kind of stuff it is a little different down here <laughs> that's cool that's it that makes it interesting for me anyway. it does yeah. it does yeah. larry tell us a little bit about yourself where did you grow up i grew up uh, about 90 miles west of houston and kind of right along the edge of the gulf coast prairie texas just kind of in the gravel hills a little german speak community called zimmerscheid where in fact i can always speak english until i started school and because of all of our families and, and neighbors and spoke German, but no grew up out in the country. And uh, my dad loved to hunt coon hounds and, and ran coon hounds at night and chased beagles with a uh, right chasing rabbits rather with beagles in the afternoon when we had time. And uh, so I kind of grew up in a, in a hunting and fishing community. Started fishing with my granddad back even long before I can remember. I mean, they'd come by and pick me up and we'd go dig worms and. We did to the local creek to see and catch what we could, you know. So, grew up in that kind of situation, and, and uh, gosh, people ask me, "Says when do you start hunting?" And honestly, I can't remember. My my dad and granddad started carrying me around on their back, squirrel hunting primarily. We had a few deer and hunted deer, but didn't see any, you know. But at the same time, started hunting with them so far back that I really can't remember when I actually started hunting. I I, I remember my first squirrel, my first rabbit, my first deer, you know, all that other kind of thing which came a little bit later on, but uh, been doing it for a long, long time and been very fortunate. You know, as a career, I came along at that time when there was interest in whitetail deer, but not to the point as it became. Uh, John Wooder started writing about material whitetail bucks and Peterson's hunting, field and stream, outdoor life, and those others. And, and uh, I was very fortunate to have known John, who's a very, very dear friend during my early years as a wildlife biologist. And, <clears throat> After I graduated from Texas A&M, or really before I did, I was I was doing wildlife disease research to the Department of Veterinary Pathology, and and so when all this interest really first kind of got started in whitetail deer, we were developing a lot of the early management programs. We were doing a lot of the uh, nutritional research and, and all those things through Texas A&M University, but then also with the uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. So. Just I was kind of at the right place at the right time, and and didn't mind stepping out and stepping forward, trying to learn as much as what we could. That's awesome. So, when did you decide to uh, do your first television show? What year was that? I, you know, actually, it goes. <clears throat> I was I just graduated from Texas A and M University, and there was a. Uh, Little radio station locally uh, it was the it was TAMU, and uh, it was the Texas A and M University station. And a guy by the name of Larry Godfrey had a little outdoor show on that network, and I did a bunch of stuff with Larry uh, on hunts for whitetail and some fishing and things like that. And that goes back to about 1971. Gotcha. So started a long, long time ago, and then really kind of got into the TV thing. When all the interest in whitetail deer was just in its infancy, John Wooders and, and Jerry Smith and I did a video uh, called Whitetails uh, Judging Trophies, which was the first time anybody had ever run any kind of uh, videotape in, in terms of, of uh, you know, how to age deer, how to field judge deer, and those kind of things. And as a result of that, uh, Bill Jordan had just started Real Korean and Bill, and some of the guys back in, uh, uh, David Blanton, and had just gone to work for them, and they were looking at trying to do outdoor television shows. And so because they knew what I had done as far as what I tell deer is concerned, and 
when he Texas was a destination that they wanted to get into, uh, they contacted me and a friend of mine, Bill uh, Whitfield, and I set up a lot of the hunts those guys first did. And so I was really involved in, in those early shows that, that Bill Jordan and the guys did with Realtree, and, and which led to a lot of different other things. So, I mean, it goes back quite a few years when you get right down to it. I was going to say, I, I recall watching you on TV when I was just a, a young young guy, and I uh, I think I was intrigued by your white beard even back then. It's like, so, so. <laughs> well, it was just turning. It used to be a brilliant red. And it yeah, it just used to be red. About, right. it's like, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> it's like this guy is the coolest guy I've ever met. He's he's sitting here rattling big deer, and I didn't I wasn't even paying attention. I didn't know where you were, but I said this is a cool show. And I, it would mesmerize me, and I'd wait for it every every uh, week to come back out. And it was it was one of the first shows that ever caught my attention. And lo and behold, you know, probably twenty years later, twenty five years later, here here we are talking on the radio. And uh, <laughs> actually, yeah, I was like, this is this is awesome. It is for me too. I tell you what, I, I, again, timing is everything. I don't care whether you're hunting; if you're at the right place at the right time, and you can pull the trigger or release the arrow, you know things happen right. And that's just the way I was. I mean, I just hadn't come along at that right time when the infancy, or it was in, in the infancy as far as white-tailed deer interest is concerned, as we know it today. And gotcha. guys like John Withers and were starting to write about deer deer. Jerry Smith was a photographer, and for the first time, somebody beside Lenny LaRue had a cover on the, on the white-tailed deer on, on the cover of, of the different magazines, and it just so happens the uh, photographs that Jerry was shooting down on the King Ranch showed some unbelievable deer. And so, you know, you hear a lot of people like take credit for being the beginners of the uh, uh, white tail revolution, kind of as we've seen it happen the last several years. And, but when you get right down to it, it was Jerry Smith photographing big white tail deer and John Wooders writing about it. And then after that, guys like David Morris and North American White Tail and uh, Buckmasters and all those others kind of followed after that. Right. But uh, those two guys, really, when you get right down to it, were the ones who really started. And then you had. Uh, at uh, Murphy Ray and Al Brothers back in 1966, I'm sorry to write a book called uh, White Tails uh, Producing Quality or Producing Quality White Tails. And between all that, it really kind of is what started all the interest, like we're seeing white tail deer these days. Hmm. That's very fascinating. You, yeah, you always kind of wonder where it all starts and uh, to the point where it is today, because it's it wasn't like that before that. I don't think there was a whole different uh, mentality about white tails. Uh, but there was. I mean, it, it's there it, it really was. Like I said, Lenny Lee or LaRue was a photographer, and, and almost any time you saw a white-tailed deer photograph, either he or Irwin Bauer were the two that did photography on white-tailed deer. And most of the time, they had just nice little bucks, and I'm talking about a year and a half, ten and a half year old deer. But when Jerry started photographing these older, mature bucks, and people all of a sudden started paying attention. Going, oh my gosh, that you know, white-tailed get be pretty darn nice deer. And, and uh, really, kind of, you know, we've, we've come a long way. We really have. We still have a long way to go in a lot of ways. But with, when it comes to white-tailed deer management and white-tailed deer hunting, we've come a tremendously long way. Right. Gotcha. So when did you decide to take this uh, this filming that you did and turn it into a career? You know, I used to be on staff with a lot of the different national magazines, like Deer and Deer Hunting and Shooting Times and and. Uh, uh, white tail journal uh, was white tail columnist for North American Hunter for a long time, and, and a bunch of those things. And uh, of course, w- what we saw is, is I could see down the way that even though at that time magazines were king, and we were just starting to see some of the first deer hunting shows, the first hunting shows, kind of as we know these days. There were a few like. You go back to American Sportsman many, many years ago, but it, we saw the bow starting to begin, and I could see that over a period of time, a lot of the money that had previously been going to magazines in terms of uh, advertising dollars was going to be siphoned off toward uh, TV shows. So it, from an economic perspective, that was one of the reasons I kind of didn't abandon writing at all, but I kind of started shifting a little bit more toward TV, and, and it was more of an economic kind of thing and a, a, a matter of opportunity, I think, than, than anything else. Um, the, those first TV shows that we did many years ago, I mean, we did a little bit about real tree outdoors, and when TNN first started doing those, I mean, it was absolutely amazing the number of people watching and the response that we got when we did a show. Right, yep, that's, that's what I remember was the TNN shows. Right, exactly. I mean, at one time, that basically was the only network that was, 
really showing any outdoor hunting shows right. of any kind. And, uh, you know, there might be the occasional local show or something like that on one of the local networks. But when TNN decided they wanted to do outdoor shows, I mean, it really brought it to the forefront. Right. Fascinating. All right, so I, you've been around for a while. You, this is an industry you've you've been in for a long time. Um, how do you feel like when you come across a new hunter that's just getting into the field? Does that still excite you today? Absolutely, I am absolutely thrilled when anybody gets into the hunting. You know, we put a lot of emphasis on bringing kids into hunting, and that's extremely important. But to me, it, it, I don't care whether it's the, if, the, if that individual is, is two years old or whether he's 102 or she's 102 years old. To, to me, bringing new hunters into the field, and I've had the opportunity to spend time with all different age classes, and both men and women and boys and girls, and introducing them into hunting. And when you get them into hunting, and it doesn't really take a whole lot of a shove. It just kind of, you just kind of have to create an opportunity for them to do so. You can just watch your eyes light up, and and all of a sudden the entire world changes for them, and it changes, it absolutely changes to the good for them. So, right. yes, I, you know, I really still get excited, you know, seeing people getting into the, into the outdoors, and with with the talks and things we do in a lot of different places you run across people that are just now getting into hunting or they're even thinking about getting into hunting. You know, the, the hunting is so important when it comes down to the perpetuation of wildlife and habitat. And, uh, if, if, you know, I can't imagine anybody that, that loves wildlife not being a hunter or a fisherman because right. if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have what we had in these days. I mean, the, most all the animals are already be gone. So, you know, hunting is, is important for a lot of different reasons. I think we all, as a human species, are pretty much hunters when you get right down to it. Uh, those of us who love the outdoors and pursue the outdoors and pursue animals, we're hunters. And then we've got a few people out there that don't like us hunting and shooting and all that. And, and, you know, they're hunters too, whether they like it or not. But, you know, they're hunting for ways to prevent us from doing it, I guess. So whether they like it or not, they're still, they're, we're still kind of classified as hunters. Right. <laughs> I agree yeah. to that. I have to share a little story that uh, occurred at Kittery Trading Post. Um, I came up the stairs to find you later in the day, Larry, after the event was starting to wind down so we could do just yes, a, a quick video. And we, we were sitting there chit-chatting and this, this uh, I call him like a, a classic uh, New England redneck, basically, um, <laughs> came up to the stand. And, and let me describe the stand. Uh, you, you had a, a chair, kind of a tall chair and a tall table. And there was a commemorative, I think it was a 22, if I'm not mistaken. It was Yeah, it was the 50th anniversary of uh, Ruger 1022's rifle there. Yep. And it was on the, it was on the bench you know, or on the table and it was displayed nicely. And you had some of your flyers out and some pictures for signatures and things like that. And the guy comes up and he says, Hey, is, is, is this a, is this a raffle or something? And I just started like snickering cause he didn't quite understand what it was about. And he was trying to understand. And you said, right. you said, no, it's not. It's uh it's a, it's a commemorative rifle. And he said, well, well, what do you have to do to get it? So you have to write a check to get it. <laughs> That's basically what she said. And that was bottom part, line. Yeah. Bottom line. That was a perfect response. And then he says, what are you, some kind of famous hunter or something? And, and I was just, I, I mean, I was laughing on the inside so bad. Cause it's like, <laughs> where has this guy been? Has he been living in a cave for the last 30 years? How is it possible that this guy has never seen Larry? So, uh, but you handled it with so much uh, delicacy because at the end, the guy came out and said, well, I'm just starting to get into hunting. And then you, you practically gave the guy a hug because he, you knew then that this, this guy was going to uh, engage in something that you've loved for so long. And that was perfect. Well, it is. And like I said, hunting is important. It will be important in his life. But, you know, it, it's also extremely important in, in, in so many other people's lives. And probably more important than anything else is that perpetuation and management of the habitat that creates a, a livelihood and place for not just the game species that we hunt, but for the non game species that we love to see in here as well, you know. So. How can you not want to give the guy a hug and say, "Welcome to the fold, my Welcome you know, to the family. I'm you know? so glad you're here. You exactly. know, what can we do to help you?" <laughs> and that's what that event was. Was I mean, it's a, to sell. It was a celebration of all things hunting, but to, just to have some, it is, yes, sir. And he was not a young man. He was probably what mid thirties or so. I would think so, yes, sir. So and to see you know a thirty year old man getting into the sport of hunting was just it's just tremendous. So that was awesome. It is. <laughs> yeah, um, I think Dusty wanted to pick your brain a little bit, uh, Larry, about. Some 
some game management techniques. Yeah, yeah that just, probably uh, won't take very long, but I'll, I'll try. Right. I, 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 <laughs> All right. I, I just I just want to pull out a few uh, pointers for somebody that's trying to manage. Let, let's give an example of a two hundred acre farm. Larry, yeah. what can what can they do to better their place to, to have a better herd? You know, keep the mature bucks. And you got any pointers that they can do to the land just to to keep their herd healthy and, and obviously Almost. keep the mature bucks in the area. I'll tell you, it, it, keep a mature buck in the area. But, uh, mature bucks are like people. There's some of them that are roamers. There are some that are very sedentary. There's some that'll pick up and leave and come back. You know, and some stay a long time. Some come back. The home ranges of, of mature bucks can be quite huge, and sometimes upwards to, you know, ten thousand acres or more when you get right down to it, in all different types of habitat. So sometimes trying to maintain that buck in one particular spot for any great length of time can be a little difficult. But at the same time, if you get in there and try to improve that habitat as much as you can so there's adequate cover, adequate food, uh, escape cover, uh, the, the ruts going on, if there are does in the area, you know, to try to keep him there. So to me, one of the things that you can do in a lot of, a lot of places, it, it just kind of depends there's there's a lots of it depends answers to any question that you ask about wildlife management and it really kind of depends upon what current habitat is and uh, the practices around it as far as hunting are concerned and what everybody else has done but one of the things that I think you can do regardless is to go within the interior try to go in into the middle part of that property and to try to make it as attractive to white-tailed deer or any other game species or non-game species as possible by increasing the food. Now, that may mean doing some cutting to where uh, if you've got a heavy, heavy canopy to, to where more sunlight can penetrate down to the ground to where you get all kinds of little undergrowth and things like that growing. And, and then even once that stuff starts growing up, going in and managing it so that uh, you, you cut it in half. And one of the things you can do at the same time is if, if you have a mass-bearing tree that whether it's a, a, an oak or a chestnut or anything that produces any kind of fruit or or uh, or, or nut, is during the winter time uh, when things are really kind of bad and even if there's snow on the ground is is look at this tree and look at the grip line which is at the outermost reaches of the of the, uh, the branches that are out there, and if what you can do is you can go to the local Oh, feed store, seed dealer, uh, hardware store, whatever. And the way you suggest people to do is, is buy some, uh, the cheapest fertilizer that they can find and then go right along that drip line and, and dig a little trench, whether you have to, even if you can, if the ground isn't frozen there and, uh, dig a little trench and just kind of pour a little bit of, just do a trickling of, of, uh, fertilizer all the way around the entirety of that drip line. And, so that's going to do several things. And one is going to help feed that tree. And if it produces any kind of a mast, it will generally make it sweeter, whatever it is, uh, whether, it's, it's, whether it's acorns or whether it's fruit. And at the same time, just beyond the edge of that drip line, you're going to you're going to have influence on those other species, plants that are there that are going to, again, make them not only more nutritious, but also more palatable. The interesting thing about white-tailed deer is, is that they have an innate ability to find the most nutritious part of any plant or the most nutritious food in a given area. It's, it's, a, it's something that's ingrained into them. And, and if you, if they're interesting because uh, their ruminants have four chambers to their stomach just like a cow does. But a cow, when she reaches out and eats, she just wraps her tongue around everything in her and pulls everything in. That white-tailed deer has got a pointed muzzle so it can reach in and, and grab the most nutritious part of the plant that's there so anything that you can do to improve the nutrition which in turn improves the palatability uh, is going to draw and hold those animals con considerably longer or better than something that if, if you'd go in there and really kind of do nothing so uh, we've created our own little natural food plots if you will in some instances and in certain areas where we've gone in and, and fertilized specific plants or or just did a little food plot area, maybe not even really planting anything, but just putting out fertilizer and knocking the, the, the overstored vegetation down to again to where the sunlight can penetrate down to the ground. So it, it's little things like that that you can do. Uh, in, in terms of hunting, you can provide that animal a little bit of a, a sanctuary. We've had places where we've had 200 acres or even are larger or smaller and just designated a uh, you know, three or four acre area in the center of that place as 
you know, nobody goes into. It's just, uh, it's, it's an area those animals can feel free. You, you don't hunt them, you don't disturb them. And, and uh, a lot of times creating those little sanctuaries too makes a lot of difference in terms of being able to hold those deer in, in a place that's 200 acres or less. Right. That's awesome. 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 Larry, that was a perfect answer. And you know, that there's a lot of, of listeners that tune in that, you know, th- these tips right here could, could take your hunt to the next level. And, you know, and like I said, that was a very awesome answer and, and it's something that we, we learned from, you know, you, your drip line, that's your exterior limbs or your trees. Right. You know, take a little bit of fertilizer. Like you said, take the cheap, go in there and, and just, you know, give it that little extra boost that that'll make your trees that much different from the neighboring farms or the land around you keep keep possibly keep a mature buck or, or you know keep your does right there in your area and you know great answer to the question larry that that'll help out a lot when we get yeah, it i mean we, we played around with that a lot of different places not not just and I've, we played around with it up in the northeast and midwest and the southwest i mean so it, it's a pretty universal thing that works almost anywhere you go yeah, that that's something that any average hunter can take to the to the woods and, and oh yes, and, and take advantage of that. That's simple and, and very thriving to work with great results for sure. When you get into to food supplement, we come into a, a lot of winters get bad. Say we're in the Midwest, you know, and up towards New Hampshire where Jay's at, we run into uh, harsh winters, deep snow. You know, obviously in Texas it's not quite as bad. You guys have been droughty and and not had the the, the tonnage as far as the greens on the ground. But we get in the Midwest, and I, I know you can cover every state on, on whitetails. What's something we can do to, to hold over uh, as a supplement wintertime to, to just to keep the herd, uh, the nutrition up, and we're, we're not seeing uh, death from cold, uh, malnutrition? What's something that you can uh, kind of cover a little bit on about keeping the deer nutrition through the winter months? I'll tell you what, it, it, it's, it's a tough deal in some instances because it depends really on kind of what the state regulations are. Well, you guys have a very stressful period of time during the, the the winter time. A lot of time we have a very stressful period of time here in in late summer, and so and, and even late winter sometimes before we have green up. So we run into stress periods as well. Down here in Texas, we have the opportunity to do a lot of supplementations as far as, as full rations are concerned. The the downside of that is if not done properly, you pull animals into a specific area and you can have parasite problems. And if you do have a disease problem, it can spread that disease much quicker. So there there are things there that uh, can be positive but can also be negative. One of the things that we try to do more places than anything is knowing that we're going to have a, a, a various stress periods is that we try to keep that population in tune of what that habitat can support at the worst of times. Uh, that's one of the reasons a lot of places that I've dealt with in, in uh, kind of the southern part of the country, we've had carried a, a deer density of, of, say, a deer to 35, 40 acres, simply so there's food available when when times get really, really hard. So that that's one thing that can be done. The downside of that is, is we as hunters have a tendency to want to be able to see a lot of deer when we go out rather than spend weeks and weeks and weeks and you know, hopefully we get to see one. So uh, there's some other things that can be done in, in that part of the world. Again, with the, the fertilizing, there are, there are things like in some areas you do have a little bit farther south, honeysuckle, which is an evergreen, a lot of the briars and uh, uh, berry uh, vines that you have, the, the raspberry blunt vines, blackberry vines. Again, those respond very, very well to fertilization. So uh, to come back to that same sort of thing, I think what can be done in a lot of those areas is to go in there before the winter, during the growing season, maybe in the summer or even in the early spring, because sometimes it takes a little bit of time for the fertilizer to actually break down, is fertilize those areas to where you get a tremendous amount of growth. Uh, that is creates a really good root stock, and so they can take a little bit more browsing pressure than it might otherwise. So I think that's one of the things that's going to be. We played around with some of that in, in the areas there in, in kind of central part of Maine where there, where there had been some clear cutting and things. It's amazing what grows up, and what we did there is went in and, and created a situation where we did fertilize, and, and so we're able to keep animals in. The other thing that we did in some of those areas is in the wintertime, if you had uh, some of the, the cedars that you have up there that are evergreens, uh, you can go in and, and cut down limbs or half-cut some of those to where 
there is is food available. Uh, but to me, it still comes down to one of the very best things that you can do is to try to maintain that population at what that habitat can support when times get bad. Uh, and that's sometimes something we really don't want to do as hunters because it just kind of knocks that population way, way down. Right, but the the survival rate goes up if you if, you know if you manage your deer herd, your survival rate is going to increase because of the nutrition that's available for the herd. Absolutely, and sometimes as we have done down here is is what happens is the deer populations rebound much much quicker than the habitat does. So to me, it, 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 you go in and, and we've had some areas that I've dealt with scattered across the country where through uh, permits issued by the state game departments that we shot a tremendous number of deer off in a year knowing that it was going to be a really harsh, harsh winter when it started. And those animals that remain are in better health conditions as a result. They'll have a tendency to not only produce, you know, twins at least, but those will, and, and occasionally some triplets, but they will have that opportunity for those bonds that are born to survive at least to be a year and a half for older deer in the future. All right, absolutely. You know, and you brought up a great point there, and I'm going to kind of pinpoint out some things that, that you know, somebody in the Midwest or even even more to the east a little bit, that the honeysuckle, you know, it's often mowed down and sprayed and, and, and killed off. And I, I, you know, hearing you talk about it, that, that's a huge mistake to get rid of that honeysuckle. You it know, is. First to green and, and the last to lose its leaves, you know. It, it, it's a huge supplement for, you know, the food source going into the winter for the for the whitetail and it, it, it's often like you burn off or cut down or you know it just it's so much tonnage there that can carry the deer on and and have a healthy herd from the honeysuckle and it's often overlooked it is it, it we used to run a bunch of country that for deer hunting there in the midwest and illinois and kentucky particularly and and had a lot of uh honeysuckle and we depended very, very heavily on that honeysuckle as a winter food supply. And again, it's one of those plants that responds very well to any kind of supplementation. And to keep it from getting totally eating down, if we were doing any kind of clearing at all, we would almost thought we'd lay out a kind of a windrow across some of the uh, honeysuckle so that you created a, uh, it worked great for rabbits as well because they kind of use that as a sanctuary too and, and as did turkeys and, and uh, when they were nesting and, and some of the other birds too. But it, it also protected that honeysuckle from being totally eaten down in the ground. And uh, the honeysuckle and, and, and a lot of the briars, the smilex or grain briar, all those are really, really good winter food supplies. And if fertilized, you know, there may not be a whole lot of uh, leaves on it during the winter time, but those deer will eat a fair amount of those tender twigs that are on the end of it. And again, it's going to carry those animals through the winter time. Right. I'm, I'm going to ask you a question that, that I've heard quite often, and I want you to answer it because, it, you know, it, it, it's something you're going to recognize right away what the issue is. People come to me, a hunter, you know, they say, you know, Dusty, hey, I, I walk into the woods and, and all my trees, the leaves are burnt. They're gone. You know, we're, it, it seems like just the lower limbs, all the leaves are gone. Larry, can you answer the question what their issue is? <laughs> Too many deer. <laughs> That's exactly right. You know, it, it, Too many deer. Anytime you see a browse line and... Uh, when you start seeing that, you, you know you're, you're carrying, trying to carry too many deer in that area for what that habitat can support in the worst of times. Um, I mean, that's one. When I, regardless of where I am, whether I'm hunting or just driving through the countryside and looking, and, and I'm always more interested in deer and, and other species that are out there as well. And, and I'm always looking to see if I can see any signs of browsing. If, if you start seeing any appreciable signs of browsing, it tells me that you're carrying too many deer for what that habitat can support. And the, the, the two things that you can do there is either reduce that deer herd to what it can carry and so it can make it through the worst of times or to determine ways that you can increase the food supply uh, on a daily basis, not a seasonal basis, but a daily basis to uh, maintain that population at, at the present level. Well, right, you know, and that's where it comes at the deer management from a hunter that, that that uh, that that helps the world go around when when that we reduce the herds down. And if if it wasn't for the hunters, and you know, and obviously the traffic takes care of quite a few deer around here in Ohio. But uh, you know, we manage the deer, things stay healthy. You know, the trees will be literally burnt up if it wasn't for the hunters and, and you know management and us taking right. taking that in control. And you know, disease would be traveling around quite a bit. Uh, that's where a hunter plays a huge role, and it's uh, you know something that we got to pay a lot of attention to. That's for sure. It is. I mean, you hear people talk about, uh, oh gosh, 
the way things ought to be, you know, than the way they were many, many years ago. But they don't realize many, many years ago, when you go back, uh, a lot of Ohio was a uh, was a uh, was a heavy canopy forest with a few birds living up on the top, and you know not a whole lot living underneath. And if you go back to and look at what what the our the Indians did many many years ago, they would go in and essentially burn areas. I mean, and just like in the the the, uh, the Central Plains, a lot of the Indians there would burn huge expanses of prairie country, which encouraged green grass to bring back the with buffalo. So, I mean, by doing that, we've become managers. And with the the world as it is, with our population that it is, and our demand for human food and human habitation and areas like that, it becomes ever, 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 ever more important for us as hunters to properly manage the habitat that remains and the animals that are there. And, and one of the ways of of doing that is to to manage the uh, the wildlife populations that exist upon that habitat as it is, so that you can perpetuate it into the future, not only from the habitat perspective, but also from the game and non-game species as well. Awesome, right on. That, that's very correct, and you know it's something that we we need to pay more attention to in management. Yes, sir. For sure. Let's get away from deer management. I, I want to get into something here <laughs> that that every year. Th- this is no kidding. I'm going to be honest with you. Every year. I get on the net and I look you up. I get I get close to the rut and I think that my rattling skills need to be freshened up. So come on, Larry, <laughs> let's talk about some rattling. Rattling, all right, that sounds cool. I uh, my first recollection, the first show I ever saw, Larry, was you rattling a big buck in Texas. So uh, it gives me cold chills to think uh, about. I know, same here. <laughs> I love it. Me too. Just remembered it. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> All right, let's Dusty. Go ahead with some questions on rattling. Yeah, I mean, you know, let, let's let's say we're we're getting close to the rut. You know, where the, where the bucks are starting to, you know, they're starting to get excited. They're they're moving yes. around more than they should, in, in the daylight hours, and they're starting to check scrape lines and rub lines. And what 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 is most hunters doing wrong when they're rattling? We're going to start out with the wrong things to do while you're rattling. Then we're going to work into the you know. You know, I think one of the the, the things that that goes wrong in, when it comes to rattling. And there's no right way at times to rattle, and sometimes there's no wrong way to rattle because deer just respond. I, one of the things that happens most of the time that I hear is I'll talk to people about rattling, and they say, well, I tried it once or twice, and it didn't work. Okay, you tried it once or twice, and it didn't work. You know, I've, I've been on some of the best country in, in South Texas where there's as many bucks as our does, and I've gone a day or two and hitting horse together from daylight to dark and not had one come up. Yet the next day I go out, things really work. Also, and so I think one of the things is, is people don't try it often enough. It's it's a natural sound. If you do it, you're not going to scare the animals away like some people think you might. So but I think people, the wrong side of it is, is not how they rattle. It's just that they'll rattle once or twice in a day and go, well, nothing came up, you know, uh, that ain't going to work. But it, it's interesting in the fact that, like I said, I've been on some really outstanding places where there were a lot of bucks in that time frame when the bucks, are, as you mentioned, just are starting to really move around. They're starting to look. They're starting to try to establish themselves within the herd. They're trying to set up somewhat of a little bit of hierarchy kind of thing. And uh, some days you can get the horse together and nothing happens, or you may hit the horse together. It may be a perfect morning. I mean, it is clear. It is cold. It's the right time of year. You hit the horse together, and the first thing in the morning, as soon as it gets getting light, nothing shows up, and you quit. But if you kept on trying, say, every half hour to an hour, you might be surprised that sometimes during that part of the day, and sometimes I've had more success in the middle part of the day rattling than I have in the early morning or late afternoon. The other thing is is you have to remember, and people have to remember this, to hit the horse together. You have a tendency to circle you and then come in directly downwind. I've had opportunities to sit where I could watch people rattle. I've had people watch me rattle from a distance. And uh, I've gotten into a picket and rattled and rattled and rattled. And we had a guy sitting up on a, you know, in a high spot, and he was watching and I finally, after about two hours, walked out and said, well, nothing came in, you know, and he goes, nope, you're wrong. We had about 10 different bucks that came in, but they stayed just beyond sight of where you could see. So a lot of times when we've hunted in situations, we've done this in, in the Midwest where it was thick, we've done it in the Northeast and the Southeast. Down here, if you've got a trusted hunting partner, is uh, we'll get somebody to rattle on and we'll take turns. One guy rattles on the ground, the other guy moves out maybe, 
oh, 40, 50 yards downwind, directly downwind, and you rattle and your partner sits out there and he sees deer that you may not see. That, that's an awesome when tip I, right there. That's awesome. I like to hear we, that. That, 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 that. A lot of times, too, in, in, in country and, and particularly over in the eastern half, you, you can't see very often, very far sometimes, simply because they'd be undercover, I mean, the, the ground cover and all that kind of stuff. So what we'll do is we'll get a guy set down on the ground to do the rattling so that you can kick brush, make all kinds of noise, and not fall out of a tree or whatever, and put another guy 30, 40 yards ex- absolutely straight downwind and put him in a tree. And uh, it's amazing sometimes the animals that come in that the guy that's actually rattling will never see that come in but the guy that's sitting you know, out there ahead because, again, I've been very fortunate where we had almost controlled situation where we had somebody set up where we could really keep an eye on what's going on. And almost always, not always, because dear individuals, almost always they'll come in, particularly mature bucks. Now, watch mature bucks circle downwind 50 to 60, 70 yards of where the guy was rattling, stand there for 30 minutes hardly moving a muscle and finally the guy gives up or whatever the the deer catches the, the the scent of the hunter and he just turns around and walks away the guy that rattled it never saw but had there been somebody there you know as a planting partner looking farther down wind they'd have taken a really good deer right yeah absolutely would, would, would you say this is a, a true statement that a mature buck does not always blow and in, in, in run out he just turns and walks out makes no sound I would say that in most instances, <laughs> a mature buck is going to come in. He is not going to blow. He's going to be absolutely quiet. He is not going to lift his tail and run. He's just going to very politely turn away and walk away. Like and, a gentleman. Uh, like, like a gentleman. Like, like a gentleman who knows <laughs> he's not <laughs> something that ain't quite right, and it's time to get out of here. <laughs> right on. That's funny. I, I, Larry, I think that's one of the best tips we've ever heard on the Big Buck podcast. Is oh, is that right? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, it, 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 it has worked many, many times, and particularly in the eastern half of the U.S. where um, it's a little bit different than it is down here in South Texas. The one thing I do, regardless of wherever I, I rattle, and I've, I've been fortunate to rattle up bucks in every area of, of North America where we've had whitetail deer, is when I set up, I, I work my way into this area, uh, walk very slowly, grunt like a buck does during that time of year. A lot of times when bucks are walking along, they'll go, eh. They'll take a few steps and look around and go, eh. Walk into an area, set up, start rattling. And, uh, but when I do, I set up so that I've got shooting at, shooting lanes to the left, to the right, quartering away from me, left and right. And a lot of times I really don't pay attention exactly downwind because I want to watch this animal come around me and hopefully he'll cross those shooting lanes to get directly downwind of me. Because once he gets directly downwind of me, I don't care what I have sprayed down with. I don't care what clothing I'm wearing. That buck's going to smell you. Right. And uh, if he gets to that point, again, he probably won't blow. He'll probably just kind of politely just turn around and walk away and, and uh, try to not draw any attention to himself. Gotcha. Uh, Larry, I, I have to break this up just a little bit here, and this is a little off subject, but I just had this okay. picture. This picture just came through my news feed on Facebook. You've been tagged in it by Joshua Gonzalez. I don't know who he my is. My grandson. My grandson. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, there's a picture of you in a kitchen. I assume it's your kitchen. And right. It says, about time this guy made some dang juice. <laughs> Uh, we keep him running battle. He, he is a wildlife student here. In, uh, he just graduated from high school, and he, he's getting ready to do some stuff with me on, on, on TV show thing. But uh, he's a wildlife student here, and they just have to stop by. Uh, and uh, every time they've been here, we have a running battle. We, we mix orange juice with a bunch of couple other things and keep it in the refrigerator all the time. And, gotcha. and he and I have a tendency to try to drink it down to where there, you, you, it's not really time to fill it up yet, but you drink it down to where there's just a little bit, maybe a drop or two still left in that pitcher. So <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of, I guess, what he was referring gotcha. to. It looks like, uh, <laughs> it looks like probably your kitchen, I would assume. And, 
And it you, is. You've got some <laughs> carrots, an avocado, looks like some Canada Dry Diet Ginger Ale, I think. Absolutely, yep. And, you're, you're very observant. Yeah. Some little cherry tomatoes, I think, maybe. Cherry tomatoes, <laughs> and yeah, exactly. And then there's uh, some juice you're pouring into a blender, getting ready to juice it up. Absolutely. That's funny. <laughs> um, all right, so I just had to make comment on that picture. It was such a good picture. <laughs> As we were sitting here doing the show. Um, so let's get into some a couple of memorable hunts, Larry. What what are some of you, can you if you had to pick two hunts that were the best of your life, could you do that? Or are there just so many that I, good? I can tell you one that no matter what that will always stick out in my mind. It takes a little time to tell us first white tail deer ever shot. Uh, I was convinced that, that I, I grew up, as I said, hunting, but we had deer, yet we didn't have very many, so if you shot a deer, you're an absolute hero in the community. And uh, it was opening morning. I was sitting up in a tree with my granddad's single shot shotgun, uh, 12 gauge. And he had passed away about three years earlier. So I started hunting with it. And, and I'm sitting there, and it's opening morning. I hear a shot in the distance. And almost immediately, I hear the sand wall running toward me. And I'm sitting up in an oak tree, probably a good 30, 35 feet up above the ground, back when I used to hunt in trees. And uh, I'm sitting there, and I look down, and oh my God, here comes this world record white tail. I mean, the biggest deer in the world. And he's, he's running right down toward me. And very quickly, I take a 12 gauge double up buck, put it in my mouth, and between my teeth. And, and uh, so I've got a second shot in case I need one. And the old shotgun was one of those. And really didn't have any sights, just had kind of a, a groove in the receiver and a little bitty bead on the front. And, Deer kind of hesitated just long enough underneath. I mean, my heart's beating so hard. I can't hardly stand myself. Cocked the hammer. Kind of get the bead on the shoulder of that deer. Pull the trigger, and the deer goes down. And, I'm, oh, my God, I got the world record deer. And just about that time, the deer jumps up. And I'm going, oh, my gosh, now this world record deer is getting away from me. <laughs> and I'm going, i got to reload. i got to reload. So I broke open the shotgun, and, and so I, I grabbed a hold of the forend of the buttstock. And with that old shotgun, like so many others in that era that they were made in, if you tugged a little bit too much on the forend, it disengaged the barrel. So... I tugged a little bit too much, and all of a sudden I look down, and I'm watching this barrel just falling out of this tree, down, <laughs> going down to the ground, and you know, it hits the ground, and I'm sitting up there, and I got the buck stock in, in my right hand, I got the forehand in the left hand, I got a double up punch I stuck in my mouth, and for several seconds, as this world record deer runs off, you know, I, I almost jumped out of the tree, you know, and thankfully, reason finally returned just a little bit, and I kind of half fell, half scrambled down the tree, ran down there, and grabbed that barrel, and I, you know, blew all the mud and dirt out of it, put it all yeah. back together, put that double off buck in there. And I am I'm literally running in the direction of where this world record deer disappears to. And, <laughs> and I'm looking way ahead and I fall over something and I turn around and here's this world record white tail deer laying dead. And the adrenaline starts leaving my system and I watch this world record white tail deer shrink down to a little spike. It's got five inch horns on one side, got a five inch horn on one side and a four inch horn on the other side. So <laughs> without a doubt, I mean, it's, it's a memory that will, I will never, ever, ever forget. And, uh, yep. To me, I, I had him mounted by a taxidermist there that really thought what you did is just kind of cut the horns off, put it on a some uh, something that kind of had resembled a white-tailed deer, I guess, and stretched the skin on, and it's just a little old neck mount. You know, been fortunate to take some really good deer, but I, if it came right down to it. If I had to to uh, get rid of all my mounts that I have, it'd probably be that one. That little thing that looks like a rat with horns that I would keep. Right. <laughs> just just kind of re- reminds you about uh, the emotions that you go through when you're in that stand. Uh, oh, absolutely. Right. Whether it's a, a giant deer or a little deer, the emotions tend to be very similar, no matter what comes through. They really can. I mean, I tell stories about how ladies are, are uh, you know, they're they're genuine killers. They're they're inborn killers. I mean, it's amazing. The human female species, for the most part, does not get excited when they shoot a deer until after it's all over with. You know, you put that same big white-tailed deer or big other animal out in front of a, a male, and I've guided a lot of men in there. And, uh, you know, the the, the the deer standing there, whatever, standing right out in front of you, and the guy closes his eyes, pulls the trigger, and he shoots about 40, 50 yards on either side of the deer. <laughs> that's so and you true. put that same big deer out there, and, you, mm-hmm. you know, the lady he says, ma'am, that's a pretty good deer. And she goes, you know, the one that's, that one that's got all that stuff on its head, you know, and you go, yes, ma'am, that'd be the one. Bang, deer goes down. You know, no emotions at all from that lady, from having just killed her, just natural-born killers, until you get started walking toward that deer with her. And then 
all of a sudden their voice gets higher and higher and higher. You know, their knees get yeah. wobbly and, yeah. and, you know, then they get excited. And I've often said if there was a feminine trait that I wish I had, it, it, it would be that because I'm one of those that, now, I've taken a lot of animals with all kinds of things, particularly that go bang and a few that go twang. Uh, you know, I still have to talk myself. It's, you know, settle down. Don't get overly excited. You know, pick your spot that you want to place the bullet. You know, all those kind of things. And uh, still get excited. So th- at this point in my life and career, I, I don't think that excitement is going to leave me. So I'm very thankful for that. But I still wish I had that one feminine trait that I could pull out of a lady and say, okay, I'll switch with you. You, you get excited beforehand, and I'll get excited afterwards now. There you go. That is so, <laughs> so. Hold, hold on, Jed. Did we just hear Larry say he wish he had a feminine trait? <laughs> yeah, I wish if there was ever a feminine trait that I, the, all the rest they can have. <laughs> right. but that, I'm with you, Larry. I think that's. That's one I, you know, if I could just calm down just a tad. It's yeah. tough. It's tough, you know. That's you, the, that's I will tell you one other memorable hunt. I, I've hunted a lot with, with handguns each time with Thompson Center Arms and now hunting Riggers. But, uh, I was on a, on a place in South Texas with a dear friend of mine, and we'd been trying to take this old mature six-point. We had trail camera pictures of them, and the only time we really saw them at night. And we hunted this deer for days and days and weeks and weeks, and, you know, and every legal means that you could hunt one and and didn't see him. And so finally I'm sitting out there one morning, and unfortunately, too, it's back when we were doing Winchester World of Whitetail, had a cameraman with him, this deer walks out, and he walks out at about 75 yards, and I am shaking so badly. I mean, worse than when I shot my first deer. And when I finally closed my eyes and pulled the trigger, the bullet hit about 30 yards in front of the darn deer. You know? right. And the deer runs off, and the cameraman looks at me and goes, what in the heck's going on? And, I mean, it was just one of those deer that, for whatever reason, not big. It was just one that, we, you know, whatever, just flipped that switch as far as I'm concerned. And it flipped it on me, and I missed the deer by a good 35, 40 yards. <laughs> that, I, it's just that, that emotion that overcomes you. I don't know what it is, but I'm with you, Larry. It happens to me. It has happened to me frequently. Just uh, it, it, it's great. It's great though, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It don't get no better. No, I wouldn't trade that excitement for anything. It's just amazing. No, sir. But boy, it sure makes you screw up now and then. That's yeah, for sure. It does. It yep. does. It happens. Uh, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the extreme huntress, Larry. Yes. Let's talk about a little bit what's going on in your career now. In, in my career now, it's just. We're, of course, very much involved with the uh, Training the Hunters Known TV show. That uh, uh, My primary sponsor, my title sponsor is Dallas Safari Club and some other sponsors that I just really dearly love for Rigger's Ice and Hornady and Walls and 10X. And, and uh, these the, these are companies that I have dealt with and would use, frankly, regardless. I mean, I, I love their products. But with this particular show, I've been very, very fortunate. Uh, we started about three years ago. I'd been doing all kinds of shows, and our shows, one time or another, were some of the top rated shows by Nielsen Ratings and all those. But and I appreciated that. But just with, uh, we just weren't getting the quality that I knew we were capable of producing, and the shows I wanted them to be a little bit different in terms of quality. And and so I started my own company again. And, and out of it came Trailing the Hunter's Moon, which is the title I used of a book that I wrote several years ago. And it's uh, basically what I've done most of my life. I, you know, the Hunter's Moon is that first full moon in November, but I've, I've trailed the, that Hunter's Moon regardless of the time of year all over the world. And so that's where the vast majority of my focus is right now is, is, uh, is in producing that show, which appears on the Sportsman Channel, and the, the things that go with it in terms of... Uh, blogs and magazine articles and radio shows and all those other kind of things. Gotcha. And how about the Huntress competition? The Extreme Huntress competition. I I was going to come back to that. Uh, uh, Tom uh, Tom Oprey came up with this several years ago, and unfortunately, or fortunately, I've been involved as a judge for the last several years. The last two years, we've really kind of stepped that up in that – uh, last year, uh, we had four ladies that were chosen out of a tremendous number of ladies that were brought to the Triple Seven Ranch, put them through some ungodly paces, including uh, biathlons when it was 105 degrees in the middle part of the day, running through the brush with right. snakes and ticks and all those other kind of things, and and uh, all kinds of different skill sets, everything having to do with, uh, that you can imagine, with, with rifles from long range to charging animals to everything kind of in between, uh, field judging, white-tailed deer, and uh, it really kind of stepped it up a notch. And then this year, 
the the year that when we had not yet decided, the judges had turned in their scores, but there's still a little bit of a of the contest to be determined by um, uh, the people out there. We had six entrants or six finalists. Let me say we had I think over 200 entrants from all over the world. But we had a had a lady from Texas. We had a uh, lady from uh, uh, Wyoming. Another one from uh, uh, up in Canada, up in British Columbia, and then uh, a lady from Sweden, one from Australia, and one from uh, South Africa. And uh, I will say this much, all six of these ladies I was extremely impressed with in terms of everything of their abilities to, to handle firearms to uh, a lot of them bow had shot a bow, but they'd never shot a recurve or a longbow, and we kind of threw that at them. And, and then they they reacted <laughs> and learned very, very quickly and put them through all kinds of shooting paces, all kinds of skills. And like I said, again, uh, running uh, two miles and, and in the heat of the day, which in Texas can be hardly hot in July, and right down to doing a, a, a really nasty job of uh, confronting them as uh, we being anti-hunters, we being... Uh, Olivia Nalos Opry, uh, uh, Tom's wife, and then my old buddy Jim Zumbo and I brought each one of these ladies in. And uh, unlike us in real life, but who have also had to deal with the real life of anti hunters, screamed all kinds of obscenities at them and wanted to see how that they would react. And I have to say that all six of the ladies reacted absolutely wonderfully. I mean, it, Usually you do this kind of competition or a competition like this, and, and there's a vast difference between your top score and your bottom score. And I'll be very open with you. There were very, very few points between what I, the lady I ranked number one as compared to the lady I ranked number six. So, uh, And I know that probably Jim and Olivia probably looked at it differently. So this is going to be one of those. It, it has been one of those competitions from the physical aspect of it. Voting is still open, uh, I think, starting just started or starts now. October one, and then we will make the announcement of the uh, the winner. Uh, and among other things, she'll receive a bronze from uh, that uh, my, my sculpting partner and world four times her world's greatest sculptor, uh, wildlife sculptor, uh, Mark James, has put together. And, and that announcement will be made on the Friday night of the Dallas Safari uh, Club convention, which is held, of course, in Dallas. And uh, I think this year I'm. January the 16th or 17th or whatever that uh, first that Friday night is. So unbelievable competition. I'll tell you what, the, my hat is off to all the ladies involved to just get it narrowed down to the six that we did. We had judges from, again, from all over the world look at their uh, uh, credentials in terms of uh, what was presented to us and and tough, tough, tough competition from where we go. And when we got the six finalists, I mean, unbelievable bunch of ladies is what all I can say. Yeah, that's it. That's, uh, that's the way you sum it up, basically. It's the only way to sum it up. Just an amazing group of, of lady hunters all just across the board. I mean, they, they, they just, I don't care who wins, quite frankly, because right, right. any one of the six, you know, that, that were the finalists, as far as I'm concerned, certainly all six deserve the title, as far as I'm concerned, right. actually. I agree. Um, I promised Jay Fish that I'd ask you the question about your opinion about the Johnny King buck. Where do you think that belongs? I'll tell you what, I had an opportunity to look at the, the thanks to Jay showing me the antlers, and I, I saw him not long after he got them. It, it, it's an interesting thing. I, among other things, I'm a, I'm a professional member of the Benning Crock Club, and uh, it's the scoring system by which we have gone forever. Personally, I would love to see this deer be scored in front of a committee uh, to see so that you had several opinions involved. It, it's I'm not sure what all has happened to take it to the state to where it is now, but uh, you know, the way I look at things, I'm all for the animal. But I, to me, the perfect record book would list the animal owned by it rather than taken by it. So, uh, right. I, I would love to see this. I'd love to see this this rack be scored back by you know a committee of, of Boone and Crockett to see. Let them finally determine as a group uh, where this animal should rank as far as he should rank within Booney Crockett. Gotcha. All right. I have a bunch of questions on Facebook from our fans that are fans of yours as well that have sent in some questions. I'd like to run down through those with you, Larry, if that's Absolutely. Cool. Yep. Um, yes, sir. All right. So Jeff Job, his question is he wants to know if he can have your job. 
<laughs> I'll tell you what, the, tomorrow morning at 3 o'clock when I get up and start working on these articles that I've got due, I would gladly change places with him. <laughs> All right, so Jeff But jo- certainly. Jeff <laughs> Job, on, by golly. Jeff Job is, has been officially hired as Larry Weissen's ghostwriter. Excellent. There you go. All right. All right, uh, Scott Thornton, he, he wants to know, in your opinion, what is the ultimate hunting revolver, both caliber and frame? <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll tell you my ultimate revolver. Uh, years ago, when I was on staff with Shooting Times and handgunning as a hunting handgun hunting editor at the time, uh, I got a Ruger Super Blackhawk in a 44 mag, a Ruger uh, Super Blackhawk Hunter in 44 mag that I have used for a long time, uh, and it is of all the handguns I've shot is is my favorite. Um, it probably followed. I love single actions more so than I do double actions. Uh, simply because I grew up during the cowboy era to begin with. Yep. And also with those, regardless of, of the caliber that you shoot, they are different in terms of recall. The single action is the old peacemaker type uh, grips, if you will. Uh, the double actions, there's generally a little neural kind of thing that, so that it fits right in the web of your hand. So mm. when you shoot a have a recall and you absorb all the recall rather than let it roll a little bit in the hand. So uh, I, I love the single actions. Um, that's probably my favorite personally out of, out of the whole bunch. I've shot a lot of stuff with uh, with a lot of different other calibers, including you know Brown Bear and things like that with a 454 Kassoon and, and uh, 460 Smith & Wesson and 500 and uh, 480 Ruger and some of those others. But that to me... Still, when you get right down to it, I feel very comfortable. I've got a, a prototype Zeiss scope on it. It's a long eye release scope that I had on it. I shoot two 40 grain uh, Hornet DXTP and, and uh, commercial ammo. And with it at 100 yards from a good solid rest, I can keep all six shots in about two and a half inches. And I feel very comfortable with it shooting from a, from a rest such as those done by Bob Geary and those guys. Uh, out to 125 yards, and, and usually try to get within 100 yards or less of the animal, and and I do that with our shooting a 454, 460, or whatever. So my favorite River Super Blackhawk pistol. Gotcha. All right, cool. Uh, Jeff Underhill, he wants to know how many white tails you've harvested in your over your long career. <laughs> I'm not much on the term harvested, so I'm going to tell you I have not harvested any whitetail deer. Right. I have taken and killed many, many, many. I have no earthly idea. Gotcha. Uh, uh, to me, harvest denotes a standing crop that you can take a sickle and reach out there and cut the legs or cut the bottom part out of where it's to take or to hunt or, or even to, to kill, even though that's not politically correct in some instance to me, is, is a much better term when it comes to taking animals. But I've been very fortunate. I've, I've, I worked as a wildlife biologist for a long time in research, and there were two guys, including me, and another guy named Rod Marber and I, who were the only two guys in the state of Texas many years ago who were allowed to take any game animals for research purposes, regardless of the species. And as a result of that, or to that time, we shot many, 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 many white-tailed deer. And, and again, I've hunted for a long time, and I've hunted a lot of states, and I was never really one for keeping numbers, so I have no earthly idea. Gotcha. All right, so Keith Haffelin wants to know if he can hunt with you. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> Anybody can hunt with me if they want to. Uh, we set our schedule up usually almost a year in advance for the, the TV shows that I do. And either fortunately or unfortunately these days, everything I do uh, when it comes to hunt, I don't get a chance to just go out and hunt for my own self anymore. There's always a TV camera. So uh, I'm sure some of the outfitters that we go with or, you know, some of the places that we have access to would love to see me bring somebody else. Right, with I bet. Sure. <laughs> I'm sure some of those, uh, they would love extra company. I'm absolutely positive of that. Um, yes, sir. Now, Bill Lawrence, Bill was actually a fellow that I met up at the Kettery Trading Post. And he, he's, he's the guy I was telling you about. He spotted my shirt and said, hey, you're Jay from the Big Buck Podcast. Yes, sir. I remember yeah. you saying that. Yeah. Tell me about that. Bill Lawrence, he wrote, he writes, um, and I think this is a question about which you prefer. Do you prefer tree stand, ground blind, spot, or stock as your preferred method of hunting? Uh, spot and stock by far. I, I I have not hunted out of a a, a raised or elevated blind in, or a tree in many, many years now. And so I prefer hunting on the ground. Uh, I do a lot of spot and stock where I possibly can. 
or a, a version of it. Um, I helped develop a, a stalking shield with uh, three nature blinds that I've used a lot of different places. Kind of looks like a like their tree stand that looks just like a tree. But uh, huh. so I hunt off the ground, and uh, I love hunting off the ground for a lot of reasons. I love that eye to eye contact that you get. Uh, you know the challenge of dealing with that animal on the ground. And two, I've hunted a lot of places in the past where we had tree stands or whatever set up. And you're set up, and the wind is perfect, and, and as the day develops, the wind goes totally to heck. Well, now you've got a choice. You know, you got to crawl down with that climber or whatever and make a lot of racket to go somewhere else where if I'm sitting on the ground and things change a little bit, I just pick up and very still hunt my way to another area, and, and I'm set up immediately without making a lot of racket. So yeah. I really like hunting. I really like hunting off the ground, and I love spotting stock. I'm glad to hear you say that because that's actually, as I get older, I have drifted away from the stand hunting almost completely and i've gone in the ground blind i I basically just go right to the ground um so i'm glad to hear you say that that's nice to know uh let's see charles byram what is your favorite state or region for whitetails and the same question for mule deer <laughs> oh, whitetails I, I, I love texas during the uh during the fall when they're coming to horns primarily because they come to horns here because number one we have a lot of deer so when you go out and you hit the horns if you got a lot of bucks out there as we do better chances something will respond so texas has has, has really long been my, my favorite place to hunt when it comes to whitetail deer but i'll have to say that kentucky runs a really close second there's some huge huge bucks there on the not far off the northern kind of south of the northern border a little bit there on the ohio river that uh it's kind of a, it's been an, a just they're unbelievably huge, and it's an area that I love to go into and and, and hunt in terms of, of white tail deer. So that's probably my second most favorite place. As far as mule deer concerned, right now taking a good mature mule deer that if you're in the score that scores 180 or better, that's a tough assignment. I'll tell you what, there are very very few places where you can do that with any kind of great consistency, and, and especially in terms of some instances now, if you're going to try to hunt some of those. Better mule deer is it's a it's a draw situation that it may take you many many years to draw a uh, a permit or license in here. So one of the places that I really enjoy hunting is uh, for mule deer is down in Storm, Mexico. Uh, it's a it's a safe area as far as Mexico is concerned. It's a high desert, or, and I love hunting coos deer. Coos deer are probably my favorite animal to. To, to really hunt when you get right down there as far as the North American game is concerned, or at least one of the favorites. And uh, there's good hunting to be had. The ranches are huge. Uh, the animals have come back really good. Uh, the, the ranchers there have done an excellent job in terms of managing, and, and there's good age structure, and there's an excellent opportunity. Anytime you go out on some of those better ranches down there to take just an absolute monster deer. So, uh um, and I have to say that probably Snor Mexico is my favorite place to hunt here. There. Gotcha. All right, uh, Christopher Brammer wants to know what your longest kill shot is. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a proponent of long range shooting. However, I do shoot long range on the FDW. They're uh, they're sportsman all all weather, all terrain marksmanship course, and, and do a lot of shooting up there at long range, both with with pistols and also with uh, with rifles. Uh, probably the longest one that I did, and, and it's not that I'm necessarily proud of it. It's just it was a huge animal, and there just wasn't getting any closer. And I knew my gun, and I knew what it would do at those ranges. And that happened to be on a uh, on a really big coos white tail down in in Mexico, and it was with a Ruger American rifle and 30 out six shooting the Hornady. You know, whether 180 grain or whatever it was, inner bond in their American whitetail load, it, it was 762 yards. So wow. that's the longest one that, that we can, that I can confirm. I've shot it a few in earlier years, a lot farther than that, I think. But right. <laughs> uh, and again, I'm not a proponent of long range shooting. To me, the, the thrill in hunting comes in getting as close as you possibly right. can. Right. In this instance, that's how close we could get. There was no other way to get at this animal. And I knew my rifle really well. I'd shot it many times on the range out to farther than that, nearly 800 yards. So I knew the exact hold. I had a Zyus scope that I could do the dial up on. I knew my dope from my rifle from spending a lot of time with it and uh, all that kind of stuff and shot from very solid rest. But again, I would not recommend it. But that, again, is one of those situations as close as we could get. And then, 
right. it was an animal I really dearly, dearly wanted, and I knew that I could make a shot, and thank the good Lord, he guided the bullet, and I did. Right. All right. So David Childers uh, wants to know if you're a real cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> you got me laughing. I wear a Western hat. I grew up out in the country where we spent a lot of time messing with horses and cattle and, and uh you know, to me, it, it, it's kind of like am I a real Texan? Yeah, you know, I am. But you know, just being a real cowboy means a lot of different things. It means something way beyond just wearing the hat and wearing boots and you know, and all that kind of stuff. It, it's kind of like it, it's kind of like a state of mind. It, it, uh, in terms of uh, being a real cowboy means that you have a lot of respect for people. You treat people with respect and, and those kind of things. So it goes deeper than than just wearing the hat and looking the part. It, it, it's the life that you live, and, and I strive to do that as much as I can. Gotcha. And I, I did notice that when we met, that uh, when you met my wife, you took your hat off and you, you said hello, and then when she left the, the scene, you'd take your hat off. And that was that, that's part of that, that lifestyle I think you're talking about. It is. It is. Yep. Um, and Michael Agu wants to know who you were with on your first deer hunt and how big was your first buck? <laughs> well, as I told you, I was convinced it was the world record white-tailed deer right. until I stumbled over it and found out it was the spike. And actually, it was a it was a hunt by myself, but my dad was hunting out very far away, and my mother wouldn't hunt very far away from where I was, too. Gotcha. So um, I was with them basically in camp with my mom and dad gotcha. and there my you younger go. brother at that point. He was just a little baby, but... Uh, it was pretty much a family affair. Very cool. Well, thank you for answering those questions for our fans. That, oh, and, my and pleasure. Friends. That was fun. Yeah, that was pretty fun. And Dusty, you got any questions for Larry before we let him go? I want to hear what your number one tip is, Larry, for whitetail hunting. Give us your number one tip. My number one tip for hunting whitetails is go hunting. Don't look for excuses not to hunt. It's too hot. It's too cold. The wind's blowing too hard. Uh, go hunting and then pay attention while you're there. My dad used to put me on a deer stand, and he said, "My son, stay away." He didn't mean he knew I wasn't going to sleep. It meant pay attention to what's going on. So, to me, the the biggest tip that I can give somebody is just simply to go out and hunt, and don't look for excuses not to. And and while you're hunting, pay attention to what's going on around you. Awesome tip. Love that tip, um, Larry. How can we reach you, or how can the fans reach you, or reach out to you? What what the, f- Facebook pages, stuff like that. Probably the, the the best way. I've got a Facebook page called Trailing the Hunter's Moon, and they can reach me there uh, and by going on Facebook. And I can't remember the numbers, but if they look for Trailing the Hunter's Moon, they'll find. Or one of the easier ways to do that is because I've got a website. It's www.trailingthehuntersmoon.com, and they can go there and uh, there's a link so they can send me an email and. If they leave me and me, I will do my best to respond. And I ask their indulgence if they don't hear from me for just a little bit because it simply means we're in an area where there is no Internet connection. But uh, probably the easiest and best way is to go to that website, trainingthehuntersmoon.com, and, and getting in touch with me through that. Got it. All right, we'll put that in our show notes and make sure we have a, a big prominent right. link thank right you. to it. You got it. Well, Larry, this has been a pleasure, and thank you so much for joining us on the Big Buck Podcast. Um, you've uh, you've made it just a, a great treat to have you on, somebody I've admired from a distance for many, many years. So this is um, awesome, just awesome. Well, you guys are very kind, and I appreciate that, but it is, it's been my pleasure and, and it's truly an honor to be on with you guys. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for everything you've done for the industry too, Larry. That, you know, from me growing up watching you and, and seeing what you've, where you started and where you are now, it's unbelievable. And we thank you for that. Yes, we do. Well, thank, thank you. you. We're we're all in this together, so we got to strive to move forward. I'm with you. Absolutely, on that. absolutely. Thanks, Larry. Uh, thanks again. Well, Dusty, that was probably one of our pinnacle shows of all shows. You know, I'm honored to be uh, on the other end as the co-host of the Big Buck Radio Group, Big Buck Podcast, and, and be able to talk with Larry. And we pulled some information out of Larry that uh, some may never heard of. You know, they, they, the, the rattling that, you know, gave me cold chills that we had Larry right here telling us about his technique is rattling and, and, you know, giving us the boost in our confidence of rattling. You know, use it. Don't use it twice and quit. Don't, you know, keep going with it. There's always that potential that uh, that that big buck is right around the corner and that one more rattle sequence would get him in your lap just like it does for him many, many times. I mean, he's a proven fact that rattling does work. I love the tip that he gave, so it makes me want to buddy hunt now. You know, right, agreed. Just uh, just mix it up. We both you know, rattle and then go down, what, 50 yards downwind, I think he said. 
Right. Yeah. Just, uh, you know, a mature buck's going to find that downwind zone and try to pick you out. And that, that's what they do. It, mm-hmm. it, it's the, he's a fact. It's factual right there. That's very factual information. Yeah. I mean, that, he, that he talked about. He, he observed that. Uh, not only people observing him, but he's observed that same situation over and over. So just apply that to your, your deer woods. You know, that's uh, bring a buddy, get some rattle sticks, rattle whatever, and uh, put one guy 50 yards downwind. See what happens. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and take advantage of rattling. When when the rut is here, they're looking for that activity. Right. It's a natural sound. You know, he said, walk in the woods with a grunt. Use, use a use a grunt call walking in. Get into that area that you normally wouldn't. I'm not saying go dead nuts in their bedding area and start rattling. That no, you know, no. that's not what I'm telling you. But get close to the bedding area. Get close to the to the the um, the periphery. Yeah, the perimeter. P- perimeter get in there and get close to the sanctuary and, and do some rattling, right? Take a, take a chance. You know, if you don't take that chance, like he said, you're not going to, you're not going to shoot, kill the buck, right? You, you got to take the chance. You got to be out there. You got to do trial and error with your rattling. Yep. You got to go, you have to hunt. No yeah, excuses. Absolutely. And, and always try the rattle. Yeah. Well, you know, why not? All, there's no such thing as failure when you're rattling. Right. May not see it, but maybe try the buddy system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, that, that was awesome to hear Larry tell us that. Wow. Jay, I felt, uh, you know, it really just, it, it made it set in that what we're doing on the Big Buck Registry, Big Buck Podcast is, you know, some awesome things for not only us, but our listeners. And we we appreciate you guys tuning in with us here weekly. And we, we tell you every week that we're going to bring the best and the, and the most informative podcast that you'll ever hear. Yep. And we're striding to do that. We're bringing the best guests we can possibly bring so that you can learn a little bit more to help bring your deer hunt to the next level. And Absolutely. That's, that's what we're trying to do here, not only for ourselves, but for you too. So, Absolutely. Uh, thanks again to Larry for joining us, and hopefully we'll see him on the road as we hit our road show after hunting season and uh, see catch, connect with him somewhere at some show in the country. Oh, and, yeah. I, th- I think we will. Yeah, and I'd love to have him back on the show at some point. Absolutely, you know, and thanks again, Larry. We really enjoyed you and appreciate you taking time out of your day to to connect with us and and talk a little bit about hunting. Absolutely, loved it, uh, Dusty. What do we have for the Chubby Times Tip of the Week this week? Take take uh, if if you invented something that you wanted, to, it's kind of a mental thought. Say you're trying to work on a deer mentor on your own, or you're trying to work on some kind of uh, stump lick, or don't be scared to try it. Okay. Take take new products to the woods. Take take them off to the side where you may not hunt quite often, just in case it's a spooker. Gotcha. But don't be afraid to take your own products to the woods and try them out on your herd. Trial and error is success in the long run. You'll find new things that work and things that don't. Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. I like it. I like that a lot. Don't be afraid. Absolutely. Don't get, you know don't get stuck in that rut or the traditional sense where you know, you're just st- stuck on one thing. Right. Absolutely. You know, it may just be that one thing that you haven't tried because you were scared or you didn't think that it would work, but you you still need to try it. It may be that one thing that gets you to where you can kill your, your mature buck right on your stuff, your product right there in the woods. Right. You got to try it. Good point. Very good point. Awesome. All right, man. How do we reach you? Facebook.com or let me say that again. Facebook.com forward slash chubby tines outdoors. Dusty Hunt Neck, right there on Facebook. Look me up, check me out, shoot me a message. You want to talk? Let's talk. Jay, how can they get with you at the Big Buck Registry? The Big Buck Registry. It's a long story, Dusty. Oh, boy. But I'm going to tell it to you anyway. Let's hear it. Okay. Let's I'm ready. Start with the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. Then we go over to jump over to Twitter, twitter.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. Jump over to YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. You want to reach out to us on our Facebook page or our, our regular page. If you want to reach out to us on our regular website, it's www.bigbuckregistry.com. You want to give us a call and give us some feedback about this show, which we would greatly appreciate, 724-613-2825. Or if you just want to reach out and give us a a call because you want to be on the show or whatever, that would be great. You can also listen to our other shows on iTunes by going to www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash iTunes. So if you have any kind of Apple device, or if you don't have an Apple device, a better place to listen would be www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash Stitcher. That's S-T-I-T-C-H-E-R. 
Uh, we'd love to have your reviews. If you could, go to either one of those places, leave a five-star review, uh, subscribe to the show. That's what we'd really like to see. And if you'd like to submit a picture to the Big Buck Registry to be on our Big Buck Hall of or Wall of Fame, I should say, go to www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck. And lastly, if you'd like to do a share for share as part of the Big Buck Registry share for share program, meaning that we share each other's Facebook page on our page, go to www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash S4S. There, I'm done. Wow. Woo, man. Big Buck Registry. You know, I don't even registry. write that down anymore. I just It's just right here. You're on it. It's right you're on, on my noggin. Right on the yeah, top. you're on it. You are on so it. on it. You know, if you got somebody that uh, you want us to talk with on the Big Buck Race, your Big Buck podcast, yes, please shoot in and shoot a message in and email either or get with us on it, and and maybe we can uh, we're, we'll try our best to reach out to who you want to hear on the podcast. Yep. Um, and uh, this is not confirmed yet, but I believe we're going down under for the next show, Dusty. We're going down under, mate. Aye, uh, mate. Going down to Australia, we've got a, a fellow by the name of Shaggy who's going to join us on the show, and he is actually um, a big bow hunter in Australia. And get this, he hunts wild donkey. Craziness. We're going to touch on some subjects we've never touched on before. We're, we're throwing in a change-up. Change-up. This is the yeah, change-up. It, it should be very interesting. And, uh, you know, mate, we'd, uh, we're going to check him out. We're going we're gonna to get some information on hunting Places that you may have never been or yep. never knew that they hunted. Since I've uh, friended Shaggy on Facebook, um, every other day he's basically, uh, he says, having some tea and goat. Nice. On the Barbie. <laughs> some goat cheese? No, just goat. Real goat. <laughs> no goat <laughs> cheese. <laughs> just goat. <laughs> uh, craziness. Some crazy stuff. So Yeah, absolutely. You know, I look forward to that. And, uh, you know, man, what what awesome things are happening for us here and for the listeners here at the uh, Big Buck Race or Big Buck Podcast. We, we just we love having you on with us, and uh, we hope you enjoy it. As, uh, it, it's a dream come true for Jay and myself, yep. and uh, we're, we'll guarantee that we, we are going to get the best content that uh, we can get for the listeners and the hunters and maybe some hunters that are people that don't even hunt listen to us that yep. just enjoy the conversation with the uh, other hunters and what a group of people that uh, the hunters are. Yep. And as we begin the 2014-15 season, I can't believe I'm saying 15, but... 2014-15 hunting season, um, start to send in those those new pictures as these big bucks fall. We want to see what's happening out there. And if uh, if it's one quality buck with one pretty interesting story because the picture is pretty darn interesting, beware. We might ask you to be on this show to tell your story. Yeah, absolutely. You know, be safe. You know, we want you to make it home to be able to tell us the story. Yeah, always be safe in the woods. Double up on those straps to make sure they're still working if you're in the tree stand. And always know what you're shooting at, always. Absolutely. Yep. What well, a man. great show, Jeff. Great show. All right, just just the best of the best. And, uh, man, just lo- thanks again, Larry. Absolutely. You know, Larry, you're a legend. We look up to you, and we're very uh, happy you joined us. Yep. Well, man, I think that's a wrap. Awesome. All right. Jay Scott. And I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. See you next week. Can't wait. Yeah.